The Chamber Music Society of Sacramento has been delighting classical music audiences since 1988. And today we are excited to have the group's operations director, Matthew Krejci, to tell us more about the society and its 36th season. Matthew is principal flute of the Sacramento Philharmonic Orchestra and professor emeritus of flute at the University of the Pacific, where he began teaching in 1989. He has also been principal flute of the Bear Valley Music Festival for over 25 years. And Davis audiences, including myself, have had the pleasure of hearing Matthew play in selected programs with the Chamber Music Society over the years. Welcome, Matthew. My, my pleasure to be here, Tim. Thank you. Well, could you start off by telling us something about the origins of the society 20 or excuse me, 36 years ago? Well, it'll start before that. 1979, I moved to Sacramento to play in the Sacramento Symphony. Uh, and a, a number of years later, my colleague, William Barbini, who was concertmaster at the time, we were talking about, you know, I wish we could play some chamber music rather than always big orchestra stuff with a conductor. And uh, we decided that we would try to start a chamber music society, kind of patterned on, on his history being from the New York Philharmonic, the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center. So we kind of use their, their name as a, a, a baby name for ours, the Chamber Music Society of Sacramento. But that's essentially where the history came from. Well, and it is the Chamber Music Society of Sacramento, but seven times a year, uh, you've got a program with a season with seven programs in it, and you perform in both Davis and Sacramento. Uh, how was the decision made to play in Davis as well? Uh, Bill Barbini and his wife, Kaneko, who were founding members along with myself, he lives in El Macero, uh, a suburb of Davis, as you know. And so it was only natural for us to try to expand um, contacts and concerts from Sacramento into Davis. And also it's financially better for us to you know, get more bang for our financial buck by performing twice for two different audiences. So it was a, a, a no brainer for us to try to do concerts in both places. I'm just curious, do you have any audience members who are so devoted they will travel uh, across the causeway uh, from one day to the next to listen to both? Well, our, our, the, the way we sell our tickets, they're uh, available for all concerts. So if a person, for example, cannot make a, a, a Davis date, then they can use the same ticket to come to a concert in Sacramento. Great, great. So you titled the 36th season Exploring Brahms. Can you say something more about uh, how that decision was made and how that's been, uh, if you'll pardon the pun, playing out this year? Uh, it kind of started a number of years ago, maybe 10 or 12 years ago when uh, audiences told us that they liked a theme season. And so we've decided, we decided at that point to try to apply a theme to every season, whether it was Beethoven or Mozart, or in this case, Brahms, music from around the world, music by women composers, music by uh, minority composers, et cetera. And so we try to build all of our concerts with the continuity of that theme. Well, the, the March program uh, scheduled for March 16th in Davis and the 17th in uh, Sacramento. And by the way, uh, all of this information, of course, can be found on your website, Chamber Music Society, or CMS SACTO, I believe. Uh, but uh, for the March program, you're featuring Rachmaninoff, a sonata for cello and piano, Ellen Zwillig, uh, episodes for violin and piano, piano, and then Brahms, his piano quartet in C minor, uh, opus 60. Uh, could you tell us something in particular about your choice? Uh, and you made a reference uh, earlier to a broader repertoire. Uh, than just uh, the big names of, of the canon. But can you say something more about uh, your choice to include her, for example, uh, and, and then just, again, your broader efforts to expand the canon and uh, present those who we may not uh, typically hear? Well, the canon of chamber music goes back hundreds of years. And so our bread and butter music repertoire is 
the dead white composers, in quotation marks, of course. And when we were putting this season together, we noticed that almost at the last minute that there were no women composers on the season at all, the way we had originally envisioned it. And we knew that that could not stand professionally and musically. So Mr. Barbini decided that he's always wanted to play this piece, Episodes by Ellen Zwillick, uh, for violin and piano. And that's why we included it. Uh, we did also include a, a woman Baroque composer who both of us, neither of us knew anything about, but she, uh, she composed wonderful chamber music uh, uh, in the Baroque period. And so we included her on our December program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, just out of curiosity then, what, uh, from what era does Philig come? Uh, she's still living. She's an American composer. Um, I'm not sure where she teaches. I should have done some research. I apologize. Um, but she's a very well-known composer and has had her music performed by all major orchestras throughout the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and what holds together a, a particular program? Uh, uh, my, unless I'm wrong in my limited knowledge and my dates, uh, Rachmaninoff and Brahms come from different eras and then Zvilik obviously as well. And, and you know, how does that, uh, that composition work for a program? We like to include music from all genres, all different uh, eras of music from the Baroque through the classical and even into the contemporary uh, scene. Uh, uh, you know, uh, American composers, living composers um, in this day and age are not getting the exposure that we would like to see. So we always try to include on our programs some kind of contemporary American living composer. And that's why uh, another reason why Zvilik was, was chosen. Mm -hmm. And then your April program, again, with a performance on a Saturday evening in Davis and then the following Sunday afternoon uh, in uh, Sacramento. And by the way, the Davis performances, I believe, are typically at St. Martin's Episcopal Church on Hawthorne, but you do occasionally do one at uh, the Brunel Theater at the Davis yeah, High School. I was just looking at the program, but the April concert is indeed at Brunel. Brunel, okay. And and then Sacramento, it's at Capistrano Hall at, uh, at, at Sac State. Um, Correct. But for that April program, uh, you have Saint-Saëns, Fantasy for Violin and Harp, WC, Sonata for Flute, viol Viola and Harp, and then Brahms again, the theme for the season, string quartet number three in B flat major. Uh, again, could you just say something about uh, that particular program? Give us a little preview. Um, the Sassons is a wonderful piece for violin and harp. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, there's harp on many of these pieces on the April concert. Um, we are lucky to have a wonderful harpist uh, who recently moved from Detroit where she was a uh, uh, second harp with the Detroit Symphony, and she moved out to Auburn a couple of years ago. So we've been very lucky to be able to perform with her uh, over the years uh, with the Chamber Music Society and up at Bear Valley. Um, the Debussy Sonata for Flute, Harp, and Viola, um, I've been playing since my college days at Indiana University back in the 70s. So it's a, a piece very close to my heart. It's very beautiful. It's a wonderful impressionistic uh, piece by Debussy. Excellent. And that's so nice to hear uh, about Indiana. I hadn't come across that in your, your bio, but again, given even with my limited knowledge, I know that Indiana has quite uh, a well-regarded music program. Um, yes. Now, We've been talking a lot about uh, uh, programs that are instrumental. I believe you have some vocal components to some of your programs as well. Uh, we have had in the past. Last year, we did a number of uh, vocal pieces. Um, I don't think there's anything vocal on this concert uh, or this season, rather. I'm kind of, pardon me for not looking. I'm looking at my program. Yeah, there's no core, there's no singing on this one at all. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you a, a, a real big picture question, if I may, uh, about classical music and uh, the, the sort of the, the taste for it today in our society and, and uh, your, your sense, if you're, are you feeling optimistic about uh, uh, the endurance of audiences um, and that we will continue to have audiences for this uh, beautiful music for years to come? Um, and if you can say anything about 
maybe the, the role that the schools play, for example, in, in cultivating that next generation of audiences in addition to, to groups like yourself playing that role? Um, all of the musicians that we use in, in the Chamber Music Society um, are teachers as well. We give private lessons on our instruments. We go out into the schools and give concerts and give demos. Uh, it's critical uh, in this day and age that as our audiences are aging, then we always have trouble attracting audience and building audience. So frankly, I'm, I'm concerned about the future of, of classical music, chamber music, um, and we're doing all that we can to, to support young people, young composers, new composers uh, to write for chamber music and classical music. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, are you, uh, I, that happens at all levels of education, I assume. I mean, at the, at the elementary schools, the public schools, uh, as well as programs like uh, you were involved with at University of the Pacific. Yeah, that's, that's where I was born. You know, when I started playing flute in the fourth grade, my dad took me to school, music school night in fourth grade, and all the instruments were laid out in the, on the tables. And he, he told me that I walked over to the flute table and I stayed there the whole night. I didn't try any of the other instruments. There must have been something about it that attracted me to the flute. Well, maybe it's like the uh, the wands in Harry Potter. You don't just choose the instrument; it also chooses you. But exactly. Um, well, and then the uh, the final program of this season uh, in May is uh, Locatelli Trio for flute, viola, and harp, Brahms Horn Trio, Hindemith Wind Quintet, and Ravel Introduction and Allegro for harp, flute, clarinet, and string quartet. Uh, Couple of well-known names, uh, perhaps Locatelli and Hindemith, not as well-known. Can you say anything about them? Paul Hindemith was uh, um, a 20th century German composer um, in a semi-classical semi way. His music is structured very similar to Beethoven and Brahms music. He wrote four movement symphonies, he wrote chamber music, concertos, sonatas for all the solo instruments of the orchestra. Um, and in this woodwind quintet is one of the seminal pieces in the woodwind quintet repertoire. Um, so we're very lucky to have a, a, a very well-known horn soloist, Phil Myers, retired principal horn of the New York Philharmonic joining on this, joining us on this concert for uh, the Brahms trio and the woodwind quintet. Wonderful horn parts. Wonderful. Well, this has just been fantastic. I've been speaking with Matthew Krejci, Director of Operations, the Chamber Music Society of Sacramento. Uh, they have events in April, and May, and excuse me, March, April, and May, uh, still in this season. And for next season, season number 37, uh, again, you can return to their website to learn more information about them. They perform in Davis at either St. Martin's Episcopal Church or Brunel Hall on the Davis High School campus or and in Sacramento at Capistrano Hall at Sacramento State. Thank you so much, Matthew. Been my pleasure, Tim. Thank you for having me. And I'm Tim Gaffney. You've been watching In the Studio on Davis Media Access. <laughs>